Yes. Hi. 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 I did it. I did it. I'm so happy. <laughs> we figured it out, didn't we? We did. We did. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today in this live to have a conversation with us on emotional sobriety. I, I was just telling the audience, I was trying to figure out how I came across your information. And I think that as I've been studying the information on adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families, somehow I came across a YouTube where you were talking, training, and I bet it was, I think it was at um, a recovery center to other mental health professionals. Uh -huh. You were training them on this concept and you just blew me away. I'm like, <laughs> he is talking my language. That's <laughs> Everything so cool. yeah. that we try to teach about shame. And so then I dove um, deep into your material and I even bought some of your books. Oh, I have one right here. Look at that. Look at that. That's <laughs> wonderful. I, I have this one, and then I have the other one, the 12 Smart Things. Um, you have, I think, three 12 Smart Things, don't you? I, I actually have four, and the fifth one is coming out, you know, in the next couple of weeks. So I'm so excited. Yeah. They're calling me Dr. 12. Dr. 12? <laughs> Dr. 12, because 12 Smart Things, 12 Stupid Things, 12 Hidden Rewards, and now 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety. Oh, that's so great. And the um, and I had an opportunity to review that book, and it is phenomenal. I am doing a giveaway. So if somebody is watching this and would like to win one of Dr. Berger's books, then go to my link in my bio, and uh, I will announce who the winner is on the book release party yes. on that date, which is June 3rd, right? That is correct. It's, it's a, a, almost uh, six days from now from 5 to 7 p.m., and anyone can come. It's an open invitation. All they have to do is go to www.4, and at the number 4, dphd.com, and there's an RSVP button to hit it. Now, I'm going to sweeten your giveaway, Sean. We're going to even make it even better. So in addition to what they're going to get with the book, they're also going to get a seven-CD set of an all-day workshop I did with Herb Kagan on an introduction to emotional sobriety. So it's a oh, really wow. great giveaway. It really is. It's going to be wow. fantastic. Yes, I've seen it on your website, and yes. I was it, and it just looks absolutely incredible. What a gift that is. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing that. Well, thank you for doing this today. I'm so excited to be with you. You know, like you said, yeah. our meeting was kind of happenstance, right? This is, you know, you're kind of searching for things. I search for things all the time. We're two seekers. Right. I do know that about us, that we yes. really, I love, I love your, your thirst for information that helps make sense of this experience we're having in life. Yes, making the human experience a, a one that we can understand and do masterfully. Yes. So yes. let's go ahead and dive in and tell us, I have so many questions for you. Tell us what is emotional sobriety? Well, boy, I, like I said, I can give a whole day seminar on this. So let me see if I can <laughs> capture it succinctly. So in, in this time that we have, um, I anticipated this. You know, you shared with me that you were going to ask me this question. I think the best way to think about it, it's really a way, it's a philosophy, I think, is the best way to think about it. It's a way of looking at life that gives you a way of dealing with the experiences you're having that ensure that you're going to grow from them. So, you know, you, you know, you're in, you do a lot of work with people that are traumatized, as I do, especially ACA, that's all about trauma. There was a, you know, that whole movement started once we realized is that if you're a child of an alcoholic parent, that you're going to have post-traumatic stress. I mean, there's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Well, the exciting thing that you and I have seen as we've done work with trauma victims is that we now talk about post-traumatic growth. And it's not just about post-traumatic stress, but any experience, if it's digested properly, can help us grow into what we can be. And see, that's the great thing about the human spirit. And emotional sobriety is, is kind of like putting on a certain pair of lenses 
that help you look at the experience you're having and see what you can do to meet that experience, to claim that experience so that experience isn't claiming you. Mm. It's changing our relationship to what's happening in our life and for us to become the determining force in our happiness, in our joy, in our peace of mind, in our contentment. And so that's what emotional sobriety is about, is about finding that relationship to whatever is happening in our life, to our partner, to an event in our life, and being able to show up in that relationship in a way where we find the best in us to respond to whatever is happening instead of trying to control the situation. So the big mm -hmm. thing here is, you know, that I think that, that, what I've learned as I've been doing this is life is going to be what life is going to be. It's, it's my job to figure out how best to cope with it instead of putting all these expectations. And I'm hoping that's what we're going to have time to talk about. When I put these yeah. expectations on how life is supposed to be and it doesn't go my way, I just find myself objecting. I find myself mm -hmm. getting hung up in the problem. Boy, what happened? Why is this happening to me? You know, is God punishing me? If if I sometimes I have that that insane thought, like God is up to say, well, He deserves to be punished now. <laughs> you know, I get these crazy ideas in my head about what's happening, and that was all because I thought life had to be a certain way for me to be okay. When I let go of that expectation that life has to conform to my ideas and and embrace the the belief and the conviction that it's my job to deal with whatever task life is setting in front of me. That's what opened the doors to this freedom. This is a really transformational concept for me on a personal level and a professional level. When I came across this information that the solution is not outside, yeah. that instead of living from the top down where I'm only okay if that person does it right, yeah. or the situation yeah. is right, if they comfort me, they validate me, yeah. Instead, I need to take responsibility to do it for, my, for myself. And this idea was a professional crisis for me because I found that so much of the therapy that we do is focused on the outside. If people yeah. validated you, yeah. if they had more empathic understanding and listening, and, and we could almost set people up to have more suffering yeah. as we spell out for them that this is what you need and the world isn't doing that for you and and you poor thing i mean you're really suffering kind of thing yeah. and and feeding this this uh, mindset that creates more of the problem yes. so yeah. you said you said something in one of your trainings that said um when people aren't sober and correct me if i'm wrong that when they get triggered emotionally that they do one of three things they either attack move towards mm -hmm. They um, move away with like, I'm out, I don't want to be in this, or they kind of um, <clears throat> like stonewall the person. Yes. And that when you're emotionally sober, you remain present. Yes. And you use the triggers very instrumentally. So can you tell us about that idea? Well, well, first of all, you're such a quick study. <laughs> I mean, you are so, you, 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 you're, I, I, I relate to you a lot because when you get an idea that makes sense to you, you absorb it. It's like it goes into your cells. I can see that in you. And I love that about you because it's, it's you really, I mean, and that's what happened to me with this stuff is when I got introduced to these ideas, it's like, wow, that makes sense. There was something wrong with that other, that other theory is that, that I got, had to get my validation from how this person was interacting with me. And, and now a lot of therapy tries to control that, doesn't it? Like you were pointing out. And look, it's yeah. great. You and I love validation. It's great to be validated. It's just yeah. when we turn it into a demand is where the problem comes in. If, yes. if you know what I mean, if, if I can just, if I can want that, and if you're able to give it to me, enjoy it, great. If you can't and I get disappointed, that's okay. It's okay for me to be disappointed. And this is where what you were just talking about comes into play here. When I'm disappointed, it doesn't mean something's wrong. It's okay mm. to be disappointed. The Rolling Stones have been singing to us for a long time. You can't always get what you want and we're not listening. <laughs> we are not listening to that song. 
Because if we embrace it, we know it's okay. It's okay for me to be disappointed. How am I going to know if something's important to me if I'm not disappointed when I don't get it? You see, mm -hmm. and we focus so much on the getting of it, we miss the other side of the equation, don't we, at times? If I don't get mm -hmm. it, it's okay. It just means it's important. Doesn't mean that that defines me because you didn't validate me. Now it's my job to step back and, like you said, add more self. How do I validate myself? Do I really need this person to tell me this is okay? Or is this something that now I need to step back and see if I can support myself and validate myself? There's a whole world of difference between other validation, which is great if we get it, but the foundation needs to be self-validation. Mm -hmm. So your triggers are, are windows into yourself, your psyche. To, to have a greater understanding of maybe what's been an unresolved wound yes. from your past. Yes, that's right. You made that connection about your um, historical wounds and triggers. Yes, yes. Listen, a lot of what happened. So, you know, the, Dr. Alexander Lowen, the father of bioenergetics here in the United States, which was the real first somatic therapy that we had in the United States, there's all kinds of great work being done on that now, right, with Dr. Peter Levine and, and a lot of other people. But what Lowen said, and it was, it was genius, he said, when in our childhood we experience a trauma that either threatens our emotional security or our self-acceptance, then we are going to require our future and we're going to demand that our future reverses that experience of the past. So if in my childhood, I wasn't safe, I'm going to require my partner to make me feel safe. When I move my emotional center of gravity to my partner to make me feel safe, I lose a sense of the role that I need to play in, t in, in defining and protecting my own psychological space. It mm. makes me dependent on you. And then mm -hmm. I'm only okay if Sean is nice to me. I'm only okay if Sean shows empathy for me, et cetera, et cetera. So now I stick you in a box. You can't be human. Some days you might be able to do that, but there might be days when you're having a bad day. Can't you have mm -hmm. a bad day? Well, not according to my rules. You've got to be what I want you to be. And see, this is where when we now, when I bring my past into my present, and now expect you to give me what I didn't get. I'm putting a trip on you that it's not your job. You know, you're not mm -hmm. here to rescue me. You're not here to save me. You're my partner. You know, love does not mean that we rescue someone. We support them. We can do that. But support is not rescuing. Support is standing mm -hmm. to somebody's side as they do their work. It's not doing the work for them. Right? Yeah. You and I know that. That's what we've, yeah. we've come to figure out. But that's where this stuff gets so exciting because we get to discover these things. And that's what's great about trouble in a relationship. Because the mm -hmm. trouble in a relationship isn't saying something's wrong. It's just pointing to you what you need to pay attention to in order to take that next step in your growth. Yeah, it's kind of like an opportunity to bring up the things that we need to attend to that without the relationship, they remain un un under the earth, so to speak. That's but the relationship allows it to rise so we can say, be open and curious. You talk about being curious yes. about what comes up. Yes, yes. So important, isn't it? That curiosity. Because mm -hmm. this is that different mindset. It's like all of these, what people would call negative experiences that people want to get rid of. I'm saying let's embrace them and, and see them as opportunities for greater intimacy, opportunities for greater growth, opportunities for a healthier connection. If we, and even with ourselves. That's, well, right on. Ourself and others. Hey, look, and by the way, when I change that perspective, I'm starting to create a healthier view of the world for myself, right? Instead of mm -hmm. setting up all these windmills that I have to fight, now I realize mm -hmm. there's no fight. It's about what do I have to do to understand what my expectations and demands are on you and how to unhook you from them. Mm -hmm. And that's what these triggers are, right? Whenever I'm upset, there's something wrong with me. It's not you. 
And this is a, this is a way of thinking that only comes with greater emotional maturity. Because mm -hmm. see, if, if I'm not emotionally mature, then when something goes wrong, I look for who's to blame. Mm -hmm. Whose fault is it? I'm going to either blame you or me. Mm -hmm. And when I'm caught in that blame game, if I blame you, it's just going to get you to be defensive with me, you know, or feel bad about yourself. If I blame myself, I'm going to just, you know, what you heard in, in a Thursday night meeting, what did Tom Rutledge call it? Negative arrogance. You know, uh -huh. you know, I'm, I'm the problem of everything in the world. I mean, it's the opposite of, you know, mm. I'm, I'm this great person. So blame mm. is irrelevant. And mm. it really is irrelevant in terms of us finding a better path in our life. And, you know, the way I like to, to think of this is like, did you have a mother that when you spilt the milk in the kitchen, she walked in and said, all right, who spilt the milk? Who created this problem? <laughs> And everybody's like, oh, my God, I'm in trouble now. Or did mom come in and say, oh, the milk got spilled. Let's get a rag and clean it up. Milk gets spilled every now and again. It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> shame-free parenting right oh, there. Oh, isn't that? Yeah. I mean, I'm, let me yeah. fix this, this. This mic stand is falling down. Hold on. There we go. You know, what, what you're saying about demands, is this um, your concept of hidden expectations and unenforceable rules? Yes. That really was significant to me when yes. I learned about that. Yes, about it, that. it's very, it's true. And see, some of these expectations we have, first of all, every one of us is going to think our expectations are normal. Because that's the water that we're living in. It's like two fish meet each other. Hey, did you know we're swimming? No, <laughs> I didn't know. Because we're in the water all the time. This is what's normal for us. So it's that same thing for us. My expectations, that's what's normal. It seems like this is the way life is supposed to be. That's communicated through our family. That's communicated through our culture. In fact, our family, you know, communicates all these cultural ideas and in standards and values and all these other things so uh, my expectations i think are normal of course this is the way things are supposed to be it was mm -hmm. an incredible revelation for me when i saw wait a minute alan that's not the way things are supposed to be it's the way you think things are supposed to be that doesn't mean that it's the rule <laughs> i mean yeah. i thought i had the golden rule right? Yes. You should do things my way. Uh, 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 that's not it. Maybe it doesn't work that way. And it was like, <laughs> God, that was such a revelation for me. But that's what we're talking about. These things surface, all of a sudden you feel like, well, wait a minute, why isn't my partner going along with this rule? How come they're not honoring this thing? And instead of faulting them and blaming them and saying, you're not a very good partner. What if we stood back and said, maybe the problem is the rule I have right now. Maybe mm -hmm. this rule is unreasonable to put on someone. If I'm expecting, mm -hmm. if you and I are, are in a relationship and I'm expecting you to not be human and I'm expecting you to do everything to my, meet my needs, is that really reality? Of course it's not. When I start mm -hmm. to think about it, I start to realize I've just treated you like an it, not as a person. Mm -hmm. I don't like a parent, like a parent or is some yeah. object that you're there to meet my needs. It, but yeah. that's not what a relationship is. If we're in a relationship, I want it to be good for you and I want it to be good for me. It needs mm -hmm. to accrue to both of our benefits, not just one or the other, or else it's not mm -hmm. a good relationship. Right. Who wants well, a deal like that? <laughs> right. Right. What really was um, impactful to me was the idea that when I'm getting triggered, it's alerting me that there is a hidden expectation that I'm not aware is there. And so it gives me opportunity to go, okay, what is this trigger about? Yeah. And then to go, what's my rule with this? Yes. And when you say that when you have hidden expectations and unenforceable rules, you cannot love someone, yeah. that blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's not okay. Like, I need to change that. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's so true, though. And let, let's kind of take people through that path. So when, yes. when my dependency, my emotional dependency on thinking things, ha the environment has to be a certain way for me to be okay. And we all start with that. That's not, that doesn't mean we're defective. We, 
we're completely dependent on mom when we're in the womb for everything. She provides us nourishment, warmth, safety. She gives us oxygen. When we're born, mm -hmm. we have to start supporting ourselves. We do that by breathing. We have to take oxygen in and blow off the carbon dioxide, right? We are in this exchange with our environment, but we have to participate with our environment to get what we need. If we don't, mm -hmm. then we're put on a ventilator the rest of our life and we're dependent on the ventilator. Well, mm -hmm. that gives some kind of a life, but it's not a life that's going to be very fulfilling. I have to participate in supporting myself to get what I need from my environment. It starts from birth on. Now, where we get stuck emotionally is on this emotional dependency. I don't realize that I've got to support myself. I still think somehow you've got to do this for me. Somehow I've got this idea. So then that turns into a set of claims and demands. I demand that, that you do this, or I demand that life be like this. That claim and demand turns into an expectation. That expectation mm -hmm. then, I think, crystallizes into this unenforceable rule. And the way my expectation shows up is the rule about what you should do, what I should do, what life should be like. That's mm -hmm. where the rules come in. So if you're listening to, the, to Sean and I right now, if you say should to yourself, there's a rule underneath it. That's mm -hmm. your rule. Listen to it. Don't treat that as this is the way it's supposed to be. Hear that when you're saying that as your rule about what life is and start to be curious about that because that's how we find those hidden expectations. That's how we find mm -hmm. these rules. Mm -hmm. And then because they broke the rule, then we're upset. And then we, if we're not uh, grounded with an emotional center of gravity that comes with emotional sobriety, then we pull away, yeah. we attack. That's right. Right? That's right on, Sean. That's exactly enough. Uh, and, you know, isn't it interesting, too, because you do a lot of this, the work you do, and, and I love that, the vagal, uh, uh, what's the? This, polyvagal, polyvagal theory. theory. It's, yeah. it's based on, the, on our biological response, right? The biological mm -hmm. response, any creature is going to have one of three responses, and we see this. It's, it's across species. If we're stressed in a situation or threatened, we're going to either fight right? It mobilizes us to fight. We're going to run. That's the flight part. Or we're going to freeze. Fight, freeze, right? Or, mm -hmm. or uh, flee, right? Those right. three things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Those things you described before, right? Moving against yeah. is the fight response, right? Yeah. That's where it is biologically. Now, moving towards someone that is me freezing. I'm camouflaging myself and I'm trying to be what you want me to be. So that's the mm -hmm. freeze. Moving away from the person is the flight. So mm -hmm. these things all are rooted in our instinctual responses to mm -hmm. threats. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. In the, in the... Yes, let me share with you a personal story of yeah. what happened when I learned this. I was home and I had injured my leg and couldn't walk and I was doing telehealth all day and I didn't eat all day because I wasn't doing my own good self care. And I went upstairs, it was dinner time and my husband was sitting there and I immediately looked at him and I knew he did not cook dinner. So this is where I got real manipulative. I knew he did not cook dinner and I said, what's for dinner? And he goes, what? you didn't say uh, we need to do dinner. And I said, well, I can't walk. I've been downstairs the whole time. And then he got up to, well, I'll make dinner. I said, no, no, never mind. And then I went into my room and I'm like, oh, wait a second. This is where Alan says you're triggered. That means I have a hidden expectation. Yeah. So I'm like, what's my expectation? Well, my expectation is that he would uh, know that I was injured, couldn't make my food. Yeah. And he would be so attuned to that, that he would make my food for me. And I go, well, what's the rule? The rule is that if you love me, you're attuned to me like that. Yes. If you don't, then you're abandoning me and neglecting me. And then I said, well, he says that that comes from an, a, a wound in my childhood that was unresolved. And I realized that I have this theme that I play out all the time of being abandoned, like nobody's caring for me kind of thing, right? So then I thought, gosh, all day he was busy doing other things that I had asked him to do. He did the yard. 
He cleaned up this stuff. I asked him to. I mean, he was doing the best husband duty that day. Yeah. And I didn't even acknowledge that. I went in and said, what's for dinner? And then I thought, okay, if I'm emotionally sober and taking care of myself, how would I handle this differently? I thought, well, I could have said in the morning, hey, you know, I'm likely to be busy all day. Would you prepare food for us and dinner for us tonight? He would have been happy to have done that. So I went out to the kitchen and I said, honey, I go, I realized that I um, – was not being emotionally sober. Like I was putting these expectations and rules on you. And I'm really sorry. Next time, if I want you to cook, I'll just tell you. So I'm sorry, honey. And he stopped in his tracks and turned around and went, wow, you just took that to a whole other level. <laughs> <laughs> he loved it, right? Yeah. He oh, but it was like a so domino thing. Like, yeah. how can I stay grounded? Yeah, because I pulled great. away and went in my room. Yeah. But how can I stay grounded? And I found it interesting that as a provider and, and someone's been doing this forever, like you can't see the painting when you're inside the painting. Yeah. It's a, to find those hidden expectations yeah. is so yeah. hard. Well, um, you stumbled on it. You got upset and you used your upset to lead you back to what was really going on. And, and that, that, was, that was wonderful. What a, great, what a great example of that, Sean. And I can and I can imagine what that meant to him. He said, "Oh my God, I'm not being criticized. She's appreciating me, and she's owning this. I love this woman. I'll, yeah, <laughs> she, yeah. You're my wife and forever." What was, <laughs> what was so interesting too is that he started vicariously doing similar stuff. You know, like taking more responsibility for his needs, and it was it was. Um, it's been fascinating to me and seeing that when you start to show up for yourself. Yeah. And you start to work through your triggers by taking that responsibility to attend, then it it does change the culture of the world around you in some way, and for the positive. But that can't be the motivation because so that's the motivation yeah, that's that we're right. in that codependence. Well, step, then right? it gets manipulative. You're right, but you're right when you're doing it for the right reason. But it really brings back that po this point that that I thought of when you were sharing that is that. When we have these wounds, if we don't take care of them, we transmit the, this unhealthy behavior, right? We keep transmitting it because it's not transformed. But mm -hmm. once we transform these things like you did in that moment, we also transmit that. Yes. And that's the great thing about this. Even Bill Wilson, who really talked about this emotional sobriety in the context of recovery from alcoholism, said that when we begin to achieve emotional sobriety, so do the other people around us. Because it's contagious. Just like the anxiety is contagious, just like bad behavior is contagious, so yeah. is this stuff. As soon as you start mm -hmm. to turn it around, it creates this wonderful synergy in a relationship, mm -hmm. and you start growing together. But not yes. because you're demanding it, because you're creating the right atmosphere for it. Mm -hmm. You're creating I hear so often, yeah. Yes, I hear so often parents, well, like kids fighting, they go, what did you do to your brother? What did you do to your sister, right? So we're constantly uh, given this message that the outside world has all the power. Yeah. They are my villain and they need to be my hero. Right on. And when you, you continue to do that, it repeats this wound. Yeah. And I realized in that moment, I thought, we're not abandoned. I just keep staging life like I am. Yeah. And keep telling myself that I am, but no one's abandoning me. It's me abandoning me. You know. Well, that's it. See how you showed up when you said that. You participated in defining and protecting your psychological space. That's that was the turnaround. That was the moment of emotional sobriety for you. As soon as you did that, and like I said, I mean, people are saying that's an epic example, perfect example, Sean. I mean, the people that are listening are saying that's incredible because that's going on every day mm -hmm. in households across mm -hmm. the United States today. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the hard part is when you do have challenging circumstances that you might not be able to change, you know, if they have a problematic marriage or something yeah. and, and uh, working through that, I think that can be very confusing to try to figure out, you know, at what point do you like, what action is the most effective? Effective action in this situation. Well, it, it's it's interesting that in in the new book that's out and that you've read that the last chapter is about relationships, right? 
And it's about how to have healthier relationships and how to apply these principles. And one of the principles I talk about is that when you turn to your partner for what you dearly need and desire, and it's not available, what do you do? And if you're emotionally sober, you appreciate what is. You grieve what isn't, and you appreciate mm -hmm. what is. You share your disappointment. If I turned to you and said, God, I wanted to make love tonight. And you said, God, honey, I just, you know, I had a tough day and I'm just, my head's not in that space. Now, if I'm unhealthy, I'm going to say, see, there you go again. You're making work more important than me. You know, God, when am I going to be as important as your patients? That's my manipulating you to try to get me to do what I want you to do. Then, you know, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're not grounded, you're going to all right. And then you, you have what we call servicing sex. It's not real sex. <laughs> you're just servicing your partner. Right. And it's not, you know, it's a form of sex, but it's not the greatest kind of sex in the world. <laughs> you know, it's doing a duty. Right. It's that kind of mm -hmm. thing. You're punching a time clock kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I turned to you when you said that and I said, God, you know, I was really looking forward to, to being close. But, you know, honey, I appreciate so much that you didn't lose yourself and that you told me your truth because I don't want you to give me something you don't want to give me. So thanks mm -hmm. for being honest. Mom, yes. Then all of a sudden we're having sex. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the yeah. guy says that to you. Then you say, "I love you." I mean, then it yeah. see it changes the whole dynamic. So when we turn yeah. to our partner and we 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 really turn to them for what we dearly want and it's not available, we can be disappointed. But then we appreciate what is, and there's mm -hmm. always something to appreciate. Yes. And it frees you, too, from the job of having to do mind reading and, oh, yes. you know, read between the lines. And what does that body language mean? What did that sign mean? What am I? And it was so interesting. My husband, when I did that that day, it was like the weight of the world came off his shoulders. And I thought, what was yeah. that? Like, why did he have so much joy and peace afterwards? And I think it was this freedom found. Yeah. And I don't have to figure it out to get it right. Yes. She'll take responsibility now to just say yep. straight up what she needs and not. There it is. And I don't have to do that. And it was like, oh, like water to the soul for him. Yes. So true. It really, it was so, it was liberating for him is really it mm -hmm. was, right? He was liberated because he didn't have to live up to your expectations to be okay. And see, that's, yeah. that's the real damage that this stuff does is that when when i put these expectations on you i'm defining that the only way for you to be okay is to operate within the parameters i'm creating mm -hmm. and now if you cooperate with that you lose yourself then you're no longer present in the relationship you're just trying to live within these restricted parameters that i've created by my expectations and so mm -hmm. many of us think that that's our job in a relationship to cooperate with this nonsense. And, you mm -hmm. know, you and I are talking now about things like cooperation with integrity. That's mm -hmm. true cooperation. If you compromise yourself, that's not cooperation. That's mm -hmm. a cheap form, a very cheap form of cooperation. We want people to cooperate with integrity. You know, Eric Fromm defined mature love is union with that preservation of integrity. And that's mm -hmm. what we're really looking for is for two people to stand next to each other. Um, In an interdependent relationship yeah, where they're, yeah. they're helpful to each other. Yeah. This is all so, so good. I think I just appreciate you coming here and talking to um, my my viewers to about this concept because it really I think it encompasses a lot of principles we yeah. teach in therapy about living yes. effectively, yeah. how to have boundaries, how to regulate your emotions, understand the purpose of emotions. Yes. I think something I didn't understand that sobriety word. I thought yeah. that meant don't feel, yes. you know, yeah. um, but really you, you're feeling all emotions appropriately yeah. and remaining grounded in the midst of all emotions and circumstances. Yeah. It's like we're having a healthier relationship with our emotions, aren't we? That's what yeah. we're really talking about, a healthier relationship. Do I got time to read something? 
real quick? I, I don't know what time it is. Do I, you? I don't either. I'm so into this conversation with you. I, I know the live is blocking my um, my clock. If it's someone that can see the time, if you could pop it in there for yes, me, that would be great. Could you guys pop the it in the, in the... In oh, the... yeah, we have time. It's 12.35. Oh, yeah. wonderful. So one of my favorite books is The Prophet by Cahill Gibran. It's an incredible book. I mean, you know, when I think that, that he lived between 1883 and 1931, and he wrote this book in 1920s, it's just remarkable. But listen to what he says. You know, it's just a fictional story about a prophet going to a land. And then the, there's a crowd around him asking him for different things like, tell us about pain. Tell us about love. Tell us about marriage. So this person asks, tell us about marriage. And this is what the prophet says. He says, you were born together and together you shall be forevermore. You shall be together when the white wings of death scatter your days. I, you shall be together even in the silent memory of God. So here's, that's the togetherness side. Now listen to the separateness side, because this is the other part that's important in a relationship. But let there be spaces in your togetherness. Mm. And let, and I love this. This is, this is a great writer can write like this. And let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Oh, so beautiful. Let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Love one another, but na make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Mm. I mean, I mean, it's such a great image, isn't it? It's so beautiful. Yeah. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from one cup. Fill each mm -hmm. other's cup, but drink not... Give one another your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous, but let each one of you be alone. Mm. I mean, wow. what an image, right? And then, then the, the yeah. prophet goes on and says, even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. Mm. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping. For the hand of life can contain your hearts. And for only the hand of life can contain your hearts. And stand together, yet not too near together. For the pillars of the temple stand apart. And the oak tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. Mm. Emotional dependency forces a togetherness. And it, we lose the 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 beauty of having a balance between togetherness and separateness in our relationships. Emotional mm -hmm. dependency makes us think that it has to be this way for us to be okay. When in reality, we need to have both, like Gibran was saying. Mm -hmm. You know, let the winds of heaven dance between you. I mean, That's it's so like beautiful. so beautiful. Yeah, and I just it, it feels so enriched, yes. you know, that if two partners are doing that, how enriched the relationship can be. Yes. Somebody asked to name the book. The book is The Prophet by Cahill Gibran. The Prophet mm -hmm. by Cahill Gibran. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. <laughs> Every book that you suggest in your meetings, I'm like on Amazon. Are you getting it? Like, <laughs> Amazon? I, 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 I know. I do. I do the same thing. I mean, if you if you come into my garage, literally every wall is lined with bookcases filled with books. Yeah. I love. I love knowledge. I love reading. I love discovering. Yeah. And look, uh, all of these things I'm talking about in my new book, the Twelve Essential yeah. Insights for Emotional Sobriety, and so. There's, there's a wealth, as you read it, I, I share a lot mm -hmm. of these great experiences I had in the office, but I also share my personal experiences, mm -hmm. but I share a lot of clinical examples of working with people and helping them find this way to hold on to themselves, to, mm -hmm. to discover their emotional center of gravity, to realize their emotional dependence, and how mm -hmm. that can be woven together to help people live a better life. I like your sentence completion uh, questions you have at the end yeah. of each chapter. Yes. It are... really helps people to do some self-discovery yeah. work and, 
and to get there in a um, in a, a really effective way. Yes, yes. So I had to stop highlighting the book. Oh, did you? Basically, every page is like yellow. <laughs> yellow, yellow. Yeah, yeah. I do that. I've got <laughs> I, I run out of highlighters. I have to buy the big packet at Costco. I know. Right? I buy those <laughs> like right. twenty at a time and stuff like that because I use them so much. Well, let's go ahead and open this up to, for questions. Does anybody have any questions here that you want to ask us? Just go ahead and put it in. Um, I find that this material is not um, very, uh, it's not utilized very much out there in the world, and especially in the world of mental health, provide, in mental health. I think there's a lot of tragic therapy going on. And so I found the resources that you have made available to be really, really helpful to um, internalize this concept. So why don't you tell the viewers what you have? You have Thursday night and you have well, other things. So when COVID started, and it obviously had a big impact on all of our lives, I really sat and I said, you know, uh, one of the things that I've, I've really tried to do in my life, in my own personal recovery, is try to bring something of value when there's trouble and when there's suffering at this point. And I thought, wow, what a great opportunity since we're all kind of isolated in this thing is let's create something given that Zoom has created this opportunity for us that might bring a community of people together to start looking at this issue of emotional sobriety. So I started that meeting on Thursday night. It's open to anyone. You don't have to be affiliated with any 12-step group. It's called Emotional Sobriety Anonymous. The only requirement is you want to be there. I mean, right? That mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, right. So I started that. We had 20 people show up at the first meeting. Well, last <laughs> night, we had, what, 200? Oh, so many. You're like page, page, yeah, page. I yeah, I mean, we had 200 <laughs> people show up. And, it's, and it, we, yeah. we've got it, – it's really – starting to develop that critical mass. People are hearing this stuff. They're saying, mm -hmm. this is what's been missing in, in my life. This is what's been missing in my recovery. These are the things. Somebody wrote me and after they read 12 Smart Things to do when the booze and drugs are gone. said, you introduced me to the Bill Wilson I've been looking for. Oh, Isn't that a great yeah. way to say it? Yes, that is. Yes, and I just want to encourage people that they don't have to be in a recovery program to benefit from this material because really it's for everyone. That's right. And the concept is that we struggle, when we struggle, we either numb ourselves out or we act out. Yeah. And to manage, to regulate those emotions. And so in the 12-step community, they're addressing ways that people numb out or act out. But we all do that. We all do it, whether it's shopping, whether it's uh, avoiding perfectionism, people pleasing, uh, eating issues. All these things are ways that we distract ourselves, numb out, act out, so forth. So this is equipping people with the mindset tools and strategies to begin to do it differently. So we don't have to numb out, distract, act out, but we can be present in the in the life we're living one day at a time and so it is this is why i wanted to bring it public because i thought everyone needs yeah. to know that i see shame as being the core yeah. to our emotional behavioral difficulties like people are studying this mental health and this struggle like the root shame let's talk about it yeah. and i see that the solution like the big umbrella solution is this emotional sobriety component so yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate how you connect that, Sean, a lot. You know, um, if you want to learn about that Thursday night meeting, you can contact Sean or me. My mm -hmm. email address is a b p h d. So my initials a b and then p h d at msn dot com, and I'll send you the Zoom link to it. Um, yes. All invited. You have it on your website yeah, so too, my... and yeah, yeah, website. So... The, the, other, mm -hmm. the other thing I do, you, you mentioned a couple of the other things. There is a podcast that we started on emotional sobriety, which we're going to yeah. invite you to come in and be one of our yeah. guests here in the weeks to come. <laughs> um, and um, that you can find on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. And then mm -hmm. I have that the Gestalt training program 
that mm-hmm. occurs once a month and that is open to anyone now that it's zoomed we used to limit it to only 20 individuals but you know now that that we're in this zoom world and doing everything virtually and it meets once a month to train therapists with from this gestalt perspective that i think really go it's hand in glove with this emotional sobriety stuff you know oh very much so very much and i've attended too and i absolutely breathe life into my my work i i found it very rejuvenating and inspiring so that was so great and i have to say you are so so generous with your intellectual property on youtube and your material like if people say hey can i have um can i have this handout can i and you just say yes yeah. feel free yeah. you know credit tell them that you got it from me whatever but you know open source it i believe in open source share this Yes, and that's very generous. There's so, so much. Well, it touches people. I got a call from a woman yesterday, and this was so endearing. She called me and says, if you have time, please call me. She grew up in Israel, you know, during the conflict, moved to the United States, and she's been coming to Thursday nights. And she got on and she says, I just wanted to say something to you personally. So thank you for calling back. She goes, what you and everyone in that meeting is talking about is changing my life. She's 77, Sean, 77. You're That's changing right. my life. She goes, never too late. She goes, honey, I, I can't do this stuff and order your book. Is there another way for me to get it? So this okay. is what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to do this. I hope I'm going to pull it off. I'm going to get the book for her and I'm going to go deliver it to her house personally. Oh, and I'm wow. going to go see her and I'm going to try it. I'll video it if I can, if she lets me. Oh, my and gosh. And I'll bring it because, I mean, she was in tears when she was talking about the experience. She wow. said she lost almost her whole family in the Holocaust. Oh, my and word. And so when she was sitting there talking about her trauma to me on the phone and saying how this has opened up a whole path to new freedom from that trauma, mm. I got goosebumps and I started to cry mm. too, Sean. Oh, I bet. I mean, I bet. that's what this stuff is, what's happening for people. You know, they yeah. hear this stuff. And like you said, it's like, bing, 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 light bulbs start going off. And you yes. start going, my God, there is a way. There is a way to be in this world and to be okay. And it doesn't mm-hmm. have to do with circumstances and situations. I say we get to a place where I'm okay, even if things don't go my way. Yes. Instead of, instead of, I'm okay if, right? I'm okay if this yeah. happens. If Susie Valinsky mm-hmm. kisses me in the third grade, I'd be okay if she did that. But no, yeah. this is emotional sobriety. It's about, I'm okay even if things don't turn out the way I want them to. Yes. Yeah, I'm finding that it really is just uh, making such a significant impact in my clinical work and in personal life, yeah. professional life. I can't talk about it enough with everyone so uh thank you so much for coming oh, on thank here you so much yeah. and we'll do this again sean i i, I love Yay. i love your energy i love your spirit and oh, i see you. why you have so many followers because you're you're very oh. spe- you're very special oh thank you so much and we'll um save this uh, this live i am going to put it up on my youtube channel so for those w- um, watching if you want to share it for your audience that is not on instagram you can go to my YouTube at Dr. Sean Horn, and then you can share it wherever you want. I'll also um, get the audio off of this and put it up on my podcast, Inspired Living Podcast, so you can hear it there and share that way too. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Ellen thank Berger, you, for, Sean, for enlightening doing this. us. And thank you, thank I look you, thank forward, you. Looking forward to journeying more together, so thank I've... you. All right, bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. I don't know how to stop it.